Fighting type Pokemon are some of the best around, so today I'm gonna have some fun trying to see if I can beat a Pokemon Sword Hardcore Nuzlocke using only fighting types. And Sword and Shield have a pretty awesome lineup of fighting types to catch, excluding a few Shield exclusives like Toxicroak and Throw, but it's still looking pretty good. The rules for the challenge will be on screen right now and down in the description down below, but without any further ado, let's do this. You grabbed your dad's old bag. Excuse me, what? Oh, you meant the you meant the suitcase? That's that's actually a way better way to start a Pokemon game. Hey Wooloo, what do you think of my outfit? Yeah, well, it's not my fault that my mom dresses me like an acorn. Anyway, despite our wardrobe malfunction, it's time to pick our starter, and since none of them evolves into a fighting type or is good against a fighting type, it really doesn't matter who we pick, so I pick Scorbunny. We then hop on a train to the wild area, but before we do anything over there, we take a slight detour over to the Isle of Armor. And this is where we can actually find our very first encounter, a Passimian, which is a great first Pokemon. I name it Hawkeye, and it has a gentle nature, which yeah, really ain't nothing to write home about, but that attack stat is truly ballin'. I then head back to the regular wild area where I managed to find myself a Pancham which I capture and name Black Panther. I also go and pick up the leftovers item which is definitely one of the best items in the game to be given this early. And the final thing I do in the wild area is actually find this den with a Riolu which I capture and name Iron Man. And this thing is an awesome addition to the team. Not only that, it has a naughty nature which boosts attack and lowers special defense and we don't really need defenses on this thing since we're not going to be taking hits but that attack boost is very nice. We then head to Modestoke where we get to meet the gym leaders we're about to challenge and they're going down if the Avengers have anything to say about it. Shortly thereafter, I run into a Tyrogue on Route 3. I name it Bucky, and it has a speed-boosting nature, but we also have to decide which evolution we want. Keeping that in mind, I move on to the Galar Mine, where we can find our next encounter, a Timber. And I hate to be the guy to ask, but is every Timber born with a log in their hand? How does that work? Anyway, I capture it and name it the thing, and it ends up having an adamant nature, which is plus attack minus special attack, the best possible nature it could have. But before we can leave the mines, we actually have to take on our first challenge against Trainer Bead and his psychic type Pokemon, which you might think would be a real challenge against our fighting types, but Black Panther pretty much just makes a snack out of his whole team. Wakanda forever! Rest in peace, Chadwick. Anyway, Bede gets a proper beating, and we move on to Route 4, where we run into this particular trainer. Our fighting types handle his Meowth with ease, but the real challenge begins when he sends in his Butterfree. You must understand that this thing not only quad resists fighting, but also does super effective damage with moves like Confusion, so I figure my best bet is to send in the thing who knows Rock Throw. Very fortunately, the Butterfree decides to go for a string shot on the switch in. And I jolly well know that a rock throw is my only chance here, but I get hit by a powerful confusion first, and then my rock throw misses! Now I do understand that it's quite difficult to hit a butterfly mid-air with a rock. However, this unfortunate chain of events means that my adamant nature, sheer force timber is not going to be with us anymore. And I was so looking forward to using that thing, I suppose we can't all have nice things. Now I was afraid of wiping to this butterfly, but fortunately we have the King of Wakanda to save us. And so, as we retire our first team member at the hands of a trainer before the first gym, I think I'll retire this accent as well. But not before I make fun of Milo. My goodness, boy, has puberty only struck you from the neck down? Anyway, that's enough British for now. While we're fighting this gym trainer, Tyrogue actually gets to level 20, and since its attack and defense are the same value, it evolves into Hitmontop, my favorite Hitmon. With that, it's finally time to take on our first gym challenge versus Milo. He starts out by sending in Gossifleur, so I start with Iron Man. Now, I know that I could have a Lucario at this point in the game if I just ran around and maxed out Riolu's friendship, but I think Riolu with Swords Dance and Agility will do the trick. And as you can see here, I go for the two Swords Dances to get to plus four attack and an Agility to double my speed just that I know I can outspeed the Eldegoss in the back. I then hit both the Gossifleur and the Eldegoss with a Poison Jab, and it's enough to beat the gym, but I mean, it's the first gym, so what do you expect? At least this means that we can pick up the first badge, and before the next gym, I decide to go for the wild area once again and find myself a wild Ralts. And even though it took me such a long time to find this thing, eventually I found one in the overworld, and it actually ended up being male, so I capture it and name it Doctor Strange. It ends up having a rash nature, which is absolute garbage for a future Gallade, but moving on to Route 5, we can actually find Farfetch. And Galarian Farfetch'd is probably my favorite regional form of all time. I've always loved Farfetch'd, but it's got such a weird condition to actually evolve it. Here's the deal. You have to get three critical hits in the same fight. So what I did is I gave Farfetch'd the leak item that it was already holding, which boosts its critical hit ratio. I then used the move Focus Energy to boost my crit ratio by another stage. And finally, I taught it the move Leaf Blade, which has a high critical hit ratio off the bat. And with that setup, I managed to get three crits in one fight. So say hello to our newest member of the team, Captain America. I also managed to get my 
my Ralts up to level 20, which means it evolves into a Curlia, and shortly thereafter, I give it a Dawnstone that I found at the Digging Duo, and it evolves into a Gallade. We then move on to Holbury, where we find the chairman who keeps doing this thing where he forgets to put on his pants. And speaking of people who don't really wear pants, we next have to go up against the gym leader, Nessa. And since we have Gallade, let's just say that this gym battle wasn't that difficult either. The first thing I did was set up a sword stance. I then got hit by a horn attack from this Goldeen, but after that, it was goodbye to Leaf Blade. Goodbye to Leaf Blade. But then we got Dreadnought, and this thing actually ends up outspeeding me. It goes for a max strike, which I survive on 6 HP. I can then just subsequently take it out with a quad effective Leaf Blade, but that was way too close a call. We could have lost Gallade, and I definitely don't want to do that. Yeah, I guess you put up a little bit of a fight, Nessa, but give me that badge. We can then move on to the Gallarmine, where we get our next encounter, which is also pretty bad at wearing pants. I name my Scraggy Deadpool, and it has Moxie, which is one of the best abilities in Nuzlocke. We then have to take on Bead once again, so Deadpool does some work right away and takes out his whole team. We also have to go up against Marnie and her Dark types, which goes about as you expect it to go. Yeah, fighting beats Dark. It's not rocket science, boys. After that, I do my final preparations for the next gym battle against Kabu, and I get everybody up to level 27, including Riolu with my last few candies. And at that level, it ends up evolving into everybody's favorite, Lucario. And this means we have to go up against Kabu, probably the most difficult gym leader in a hardcore Nuzlocke of Sword and Shield. And I initially lead off with Galley just the same as I did against Nessa, as Kabu goes for a will a wisp but I have the raw spirit to heal off the burn. I follow this up with a swords dance to boost my attack, and the thing is, I know I'm gonna get will o wisp immediately the next turn, so my plan is to set up to plus six so the burn gets me down to plus three. And this is pretty much exactly what happens. I get burned, I get my plus six with swords dances, and then I get hit by a fire spin, but fortunately, since I take nine tails out with an earthquake, that means that I can actually switch. Next up is Arcanine, and it gets us down pretty low with a flame wheel, but we can survive the burn even after we take it out with an earthquake. And so now is where the problem comes in. We have to face Scorch, which is a bug type, which resists fighting, so I decide to swap out into Passimian. Not that Passimian can really do any better than anybody else on the team here, but it's at least not burned like Gallade. But since we swapped from Gallade, it wants to go for Max Flutterby, which fighting resists. For whatever reason, fighting and bug resist each other. Have you ever slapped a bug? I would argue that should be super effective. Anyway, here we get hit by a G-Max Sentaferno through Protect, which doesn't do that much damage, but it does trap us in a fire spin. Fortunately, we have Citrus to heal us up a bit, and I use a bulk up the next turn since I'm faster, which means that I can take this hit a bit better since it's based off a of physical move. This means the Scent of Scorch's G-Max turns are up, but we are still trapped in that fire spin, which means we can't switch out, and our health is getting really low. After hitting Scent of Scorch for about half damage with an Earthquake and expecting to get taken out, it goes for Coil, which is good since we survive, but that defense boost means that Scent of Scorch can survive an Earthquake, which means we get taken out no matter what because of that fire spin. Very unfortunate we have to get the second death of the run, so I send in Bucky to finish off Scorch with a fake out, and that is it for the third badge. All things considered, that could have gone a lot worse, and I'm very happy we got through it with only one casualty. Moving towards Hammerlock, we have to go through the wild area once again where we can find a mock shop. I name it Hulk, and shortly thereafter, I find a stuffle that I name Rocket. Run, 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 run! Listen, I know we keep returning to this, but fetch your bloody trousers, old chap! Now, before we can get to Stow on side, I decided to find myself a Halucha, which is only a 2% encounter, and it took me like half an hour to find this thing. But eventually, I managed to find it and catch it, and I name it Falcon, which means we're ready to take on the next gym challenge against B and her fighting types. And since her hip on top really can't do that much to our Falcon, I decide to set up some swords dances and prepare for the- wait, what's going on? Hold on, guys, let me just pick this up. Oh, hey, Nick, this is actually perfect. You've got Doc in your username, so what would you call what I'm about to do to Bay's team in medical terms? Oh, that's easy. The medical terminology we would use for these kinds of actions would be getting absolutely destroyed. Or if you want me to be more specific, we can call it total trainer failure with sudden onset team destruction. Thanks for the clarification, Nick. Also, he's not wrong. Big got absolutely destroyed in this fight, and we get to claim our fourth gym badge. After the fight, I level up Pancham to level 32, while we have Scraggy in the team, which means it evolves into a Pangoro. After that, we can proceed to Balanleo, which happens to be my favorite city in all of Pokemon. Hey, don't interrupt our conversation. Excuse me, what? Who are you talking to? I swear these NPC interactions get weirder and weirder what the f- Anyway, we got our next gym fight to worry about against Opal and her fairy types, which you might think would be very difficult for fighting types, but we have Lucario. And not only that, during the Opal fight, you get these questions, and if you know the answer, you just get free boosts. So the first turn, I get to set up both a Nasty Plot and an Agility for free. I then go ahead and set up another two Nasty Plots, and from there, it's just a Flash Cannon and Aura Sphere Massacre of her team. And personally, I think the twist on Opal's fight is really cool if you don't know the answers, but if you've played this game as many times 
times as I have, it makes it super trivial no matter what type you use. And even though we've had a pretty easy time so far, this run did give me a run for my money later on. And as we move on forward through the Galar region, we have to fight Hop once again. I think you fight him like 10 times, and we sweep him right on through, but the important thing about this fight is that we get Scraggy to a high enough level that it evolves into Scrafty. Then as we continue our way to Sir Chester, we find one of my favorite new Galarian Pokemon after this run, and that is Phalanx. I captured a name at Ant-Man, and it has a neutral nature and the battle armor ability, which is so useful in these runs, since it can't get crit. We then arrive in the Winter Wonderland city of Sir Chester, and here I decide to go to the local pizzeria. Hey kid, you looking for a pizza? Uh, dude, we've already established that I'm Swedish. I only eat meatballs. Please don't eat me. Actually, I'm Italian. An Italian meatball, so I'm safe! For now, perhaps. For now. And with that ambiguous threat out of the way, it's time for us to take on Gordy and his rock types. He starts out with Barbarical, so I start out with Doctor Strange, who can outspeed and take it out with a quad effective Leaf Blade right away. We then have to go up against Stone Journer, so I set up a sword stance to power myself up a bit, and he goes for Wonder Room, which is very odd. It swaps everyone's defense and special defense, but since he has 20 special defense, that means he now has 20 physical defense, and we could just take him out in one hit. Yeah, Gordy, I'm not sure where you were going with that plan, but Shuckle is up next, and since it has the same defense, defense and special defense. Wonder Room doesn't really matter, but we can still take it out in one hit with close combat. Then it's time for his G-Max Colossal, and this thing is both quad weak to water and ground, so as long as you have either of those moves and you can outspeed, you're pretty much guaranteed this win. Get out of here, Gordy. Why are you still using fossil fuels? Get with the program. And so I get the sixth badge about as easy as stealing candy from a kid. We can then move on to Route 9, where I find my next encounter of Graplock that I name Mr. Fantastic. And before we can move on to the Spike Myth Gym, we have to go up against Marty, who uses dark types. Now the thing about Marnie is that her lead light part has Snarl, so if you have anything that can tank dark moves, you can just set up on her and destroy your team. And this is generally a big flaw in the game design that you can exploit in these hardcore Nuzlocke, especially in the Emerald Elite 4, but we're gonna do the same to Piers. The thing about Piers is it's actually pretty difficult to set up against his Scrafty because it has Sand Attack, which can kind of ruin your plans. And after getting intimidated, it goes for Fake Out, which means I can outspeed the next turn, go for Encore, and now this Scrafty is locked locked out of playing the game. And so what my plan is going forward is to go for three Feather Dances to lower this Scrafty's attack as much as possible so that I can later swap in Lucario. And as soon as I swap in Lucario, Scrafty's Encore actually ends, which means it's going to start going for Sand Attacks as I set up my Nasty Plots. And you might think that this would actually be a huge problem since we're not going to hit our moves, but we can get around this with a bit of cheese. The third turn I go for a Nasty Plot, it goes for Brick Break, which actually does a fair amount of damage for being minus six, but after that, I'm free to unleash an Onslaught Slot of Aura Sphere, which is a move that can never miss, so those sand attacks did nothing, buddy. I don't do encores, get it? Not songs, not moves, not Pokemon. Yeah, well, unfortunately for you, Piers, I do encores, which means that you lose this fight and I get the 7th gym badge. And it's from here on out that some of the battles were actually surprisingly tricky. We then head to Hammerlock, where we run into Leon, who's still dressing like this. Dude, you look like you robbed a thrift store blindfolded. I wore better. You certainly did, Andrew. Giving me a run for my money is Miss Galler. Speaking of which, we now have to go up against the former Miss Galler, the social media king, Raihan. And so to start out this fight, I lead off with Iron Man and Bucky and go for a fake out on the Gigalith so that it can't body press Iron Man. Flygon then goes for a breaking swipe, which means both of my Pokemon are going to lose one stage of their attack, but it doesn't matter too much since I'm a special attacking Lucario. That being the case, I go for a nasty plot and the next turn I lead off with a protect. However, Flygon decides to target my Lucario and hits me with a Thunder Punch that doesn't do too much damage and I can set up another Nasty Plot. Gigalith then decides to throw and goes for a Stealth Rock instead of Body Press, which I do have Choppleberry on Lucario for. I also decided to go to the move relearner and relearn Helping Hand so that I can power up Lucario with Bucky. Then after I get my attack lowered again by Breaking Swipe, I can take out the Gigalith in one hit, which I definitely didn't need that Helping Hand for. Ryan then sends in his Sandaconda, so I decide to do the exact same thing and go for a Helping Hand, after which I get hit by a Thunder Punch and can take out Sandaconda with another Aura Sphere. Two down, two to go, and Ryan's next Pokemon is his Duraludon, which he's obviously going to Gigantamax. Now, what I did here was actually kind of a gamble, because I'm at pretty low health and I wasn't quite sure if Flygon was going to take me out. It was a range in my calculations. And losing Lucario would be a big hit to the team, but I decided to go for the helping hand here to power up Lucario one more time. I then get hit by the Thunder Punch and I very narrowly survive on 1 HP. This means that I actually get to fire off my Aura 
Sphere and take out that Duraludon, which means we only have Flygon left to deal with. Naturally, I can't risk Lucario at this point, so I swap out for Deadpool and go for Protect, but I get hit by the Thunder Punch on Deadpool anyway, so I guess that Protect doesn't matter. I then get hit by another Breaking Swipe, which means that my following Close Combat and Brick Break combo is gonna do pretty much nothing. And since my defenses have been lowered, I decide to swap out Bucky for his pal Captain America, and I then get hit by another Breaking Swipe, lowering my attack even further as a Crunch gets it down into the red, and the next turn I can just finish it off with a first impression from Cap. This means we got through this battle without losing anyone, and I'm always afraid to take on Raihan. Double battles are not my forte. But this also means that we can claim our final gym badge. And now that the level cap is a little bit higher, we can finally head to the Lake of Outrage where we can pick up the Focus Sash and the Assault Vest. And most importantly, we can find our next encounter, the pseudo-legendary Jang mo -O. I name it Shang-Chi, and it has an adamant nature which is about as perfect as it gets, but we have to box it since it's level 52. We then have to tread the dangerous path that is Route 10, but Captain America takes care of the competition easily and we can get to Winden. This is it, the big city where we're going to take part in the Pokemon League, and our first opponent is Marnie and her Dark Types once again. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Marnie has this easily cheesed Lipard, but it does use Torment, so we have to keep in mind that we can't use the same move twice in a row. So the first turn, I go for a Swords Dance to set up my attack to plus two. I then get hit by a Snarl, after which I use No Retreat, which is Phalanx's signature move. It boosts all your stats, but now you can't switch out. This means that I'm fully committed to using Phalanx in this battle, and if things start to go south, there's nothing we can do about it. After that second Swords Dance, I'm at plus five attack, which means I use No Retreat just so that I can cycle through Swords Dance and get to max attack once again. Once I'm at max attack, Lightpart uses Prankster Nasty Plot, and we can just take it out with a single close combat. I then cycle between Brick Break and Close Combat, it being very important that we use Close Combat first so that we can use it against the G-Max Grim Snarl, which only goes down to a plus six Close Combat and not Brick Break. And with that, we actually beat Marnie with what I thought was a pretty clever and fun strategy using Phalanx, but now we're up against Trainer Hop. And since Hop uses such a variety of Pokemon on his team, we want to set something up so that we can just sweep through them, which is actually pretty difficult since he has Dub Wool. I do decide to use Will-O-Wisp on it to cut its attack in half, and I also have a Cherry Berry equipped in the case that Body Slam actually paralyzes. The next turn, Double boosts its defense by three stages as I set up a Swords Dance. Very fortunately, I don't get paralyzed the next turn as I get hit by a Body Slam and can set up to plus four with another sword stance. Double then goes for another cotton guard to get to plus six, but I actually end up taking it out with a close combat. And once we've done that, it's pretty much a clean sweep. I made sure to have Earthquake for the pin Kirchin, and everything else just goes down to plus four close combat. So that's it for Hop. I certainly got lucky by not getting paralyzed from Body Slam, but very fortunately, everything worked out swimmingly, and after the battle, Jang Moo actually managed to evolve into a Haka Moo. Being a doorman is a lot of work. It doesn't matter how many people come and go, mistakes are unacceptable. That's why we have Pokemon helping us out, too. Dude, Honage will steal your soul if you grab it. How does that help you as a doorman? No soul, no service. <laughs> anyway, I make my way back to Balan Leia to pick up the Choice Scarf. And then after beating Macrocosmos Elijah, Hakamoo finally evolves into the sweet, sweet Kamoo. We then have to witness Oleana's mental breakdown as she challenges us to a battle. She starts out with her Frostlass as I send in Deadpool to prepare for the sweep, or at least what I thought was going to be a sweep. She misses a Will-O-Wisp, which is actually really important due to a miscalculation on my part as I go for a Dragon Dance. The next turn, she actually outspeeds me even after Dragon Dance, which was a misplay on my part, but since she missed, I actually have my Rossberry left so I can heal off the burn and hit her with a crunch. This means my Moxie activates so I get an additional plus one in attack, and we have to go up against Serena, which is an easy one-hit KO with a Fire Punch. This, of course, means I get another plus one in attack with Moxie, and this is why Moxie is pretty broken in Nuzlocke. My Lodic just goes down to a Thunder Punch, and we get yet another boost. Salazzle is up next, and even though it outspeeds and manages to hit us with a Venoshock that gets a crit, it really doesn't do that much, and I can take it out with a single punch. And this is where the battle actually managed to surprise me. As you can tell, my moveset is Crunch, Thunder Punch, Fire Punch, and Dragon Dance, so I don't really have anything to hit this Garboder for super effective damage. And so in turn, this means that I choose to go for Thunder Punch, but it only does about half to this Garboder and activates weak armor, so now it's a fast pile of garbage. I then get hit by its G-Max move, which also poisons me, and after that poison, I'm left with very very little HP, so naturally I have to swap out of all my boosts. Thinking it's going to go for the G-Max Meloder once again, I swap into Lucario to be immune, but it goes for Max Quake instead and hits me for massive damage. I very fortunately survive on 11 HP, and I can swap 
into Halucha to dodge that last max quake. This means Garbodor is going to shrink down to its regular size, and it actually hits me for massive damage with Gunk Shot as I hit it with Aerial Ace to not quite take it out, activating another weak armor boost. I had no idea the scariest part of this run so far was going to be against a supersonic heap of trash, but I send in Bucky to finish things up with a much needed fake out. And with that, we managed to defeat Oleana, who is in desperate need of a lunch break. Go get some help, lady. There are times when adults just can't seem to have an honest discussion with one another. Sometimes our pride gets in the way. Yeah, dude, I know you're trying to make a point about how adults can be very touchy about status and money, but your dishonesty stems from the fact that you're trying to annihilate humanity. It's a little bit different, Rose. Anyway, next up is Bede, and he has a team of fairy types much like Opal, so we're going to use the same strategy we used against Opal and send in Lucario. Since we're running a special Lucario, we don't care at all about that Intimidate, and we can just start setting up our nasty plots. After that, the battle isn't particularly interesting. It's just a flash cannon massacre. But you know what, Bede? That's exactly what you deserve after being an insufferable pain throughout the entire story of this game. But look on the bright side, he already looks like a grandma, so maybe he can fill Opal's shoes. But now that we've taken care of our rivals, it's time to finally get to the part of the game that gets kinda dicey. Nessa sends in Golisopod, so I go into Falcon to use Aerial Ace, which doesn't quite get it to half health. Fortunately though, Golisopod just goes for a sword stand, so I can hit it with another Aerial Ace to get it down into the red and send it out with Emergency Exit. After that, she sends in Pelipper, which sets up the rain with its Drizzle ability, but we're able to just take it out with a single quad effective Thunder Punch. However, the fact that it set up the rain is kinda scary since the next Pokemon we have to face is Barascudo, which is a speed demon. And so not only do we tank a liquidation pretty poorly, Thunder Punch doesn't quite take it out, so I have to switch out of Halucha. I decide to go into Bucky as I expect her to go for a full restore and then go for Fake Out the next turn just so that the rain stops. This means that the next turn I'm gonna be able to tank that liquidation at above half health and go for a close combat to take out this Barascudo once and for all. To be honest, that Barascudo is probably the scariest thing on her team, but next up she goes into Golisopod, but luckily I have the quick attack so that we can just take it out as soon as it comes out. I then make kind of a mistake here because I should have expected this thing to go for Aqua Ring. It usually always does, but I switch into Black Panther just so that I can go for a parting shot for a safer switch into Captain America. And on the switch here, I do have to eat a Waterfall, but it doesn't do that much damage, and I can take it out the next turn with a Leaf Blade. And you'll note that I was actually faster right there, and the only reason I outsped and that I'm going to outspeed this Dreadnought is because I have the Choice Scarf item that we picked up earlier. And so this means that I can hit Nessa's Dreadnought with a quad effective Leaf Blade, and obviously it takes that- hold on, what? Yeah, even though I hit it with a quad effective move, I didn't manage to take it out in one hit, which means we get hit by a powerful G-Max move, which we actually survive. And so funny enough, we can just outspeed the next turn with our Scarf and take it out with another Leaf Blade. That was pretty unexpected. And so if we had this much trouble with Nessa, what about B? I mean, we're super effective against B, right? What, what could go wrong? <laughs> Nothing could go wrong here, guys. Guys. We start out with the Halucha mirror match, and I go for a sword stance, and I did have a Koba Berry to reduce flying damage, but since flying press isn't specifically a flying move, it's listed as fighting when you select a move, it doesn't actually reduce the damage, but we don't take that much. I can then take out B's Halucha with a single Aerial Ace as well as her Grab Locked. She then sends in her own Surfetched, and since I only have one boost at the moment, I decide to go for a Sword Stance as it misses a Slam. I then decide to stick with plus four and not plus six, and go for the Aerial Ace here just to take it out. And at this point, B sends in her own Phalanx, which just goes down to a plus four Aerial Ace, no problem. And at this point, we only have B's Machamp left, and we're gonna take- oh, hold on, let me just take this. Uh, hey Axel, I just checked over your history, and it seems like you're predisposed to getting Destrollish this fight. So careful, big guy. Predisposed to getting distraught? What are you talking about? Oh. Yeah, you know how I said that I skipped going to plus six? Well, that was a big mistake, because now we're losing the Falcon. I then decide to go into Bucky as she goes for a full restore, and I go for a fake out, which doesn't actually cancel out G-Max moves anyway. The next turn, I actually manage to misclick and go for another fake out, which doesn't do anything, obviously, and I get hit by a max strike pretty hard. This means Machamp will shrink down again, but since we're at lowered speed, I decide to swap out. So I go into Gallade, who I figure can take some hits, which is obviously true, and I go for a Will-O-Wisp to lower his attack, but then I realize that he has guts. So instead of weakening Machamp, I just gave it a big buff! Yay me! I then decide to go for Fake Out for some more burn damage, but since I don't want to take a hit, I swap into Phalanx, who actually manages to dodge the cross chop since this Machamp doesn't have no guard, and I can hit it with a close combat to really low health. In fact, so low health that this Machamp is going to go down to the burn, but not before it takes us out with a revenge. Yeah, losing half my team to be like this definitely gives me Vietnam flashbacks from my first Sword and Shield run, and it's very unfortunate. 
mention it. Moving on though, we'll have to weep for our fallen comrades at another time because it's time to take on Raihan. He starts out with Torkoal as it's Kamoa's debut and I go for a Totemize to double my speed. Raihan then decides to go for the Yawn, which means I'm gonna fall asleep at the end of the next turn. However, before any of that, I go for a Belly Drum, which halves my HP but maximizes my attack as I get hit by a Body Press, which doesn't really do much at all. Chestoberry then wakes me up and I can start going for Dragon Claws to take out Raihan's team lickety split. The only problem is Duraludon could survive a plus six Dragon Claw, so I had Brick Break as my fourth move to take it out in one hit. Yeah, Raihan really has no shot at being Galar's top model, not while I'm around. And so this means we beat the Elite Four and we can move- hold on. Before anything else, we have to meet up with the Legendaries, and Zacian looks like it has a string of sausages attached to it. Talk about a hot dog. And you know how I told you guys that Rose was plotting to annihilate all of humanity? Well, we're here to stop him. And probably the biggest flaw of his whole plan is to challenge me to a battle right here. Like, he knows that I have only fighting types, and he uses steel types. Anyway, that's obviously going to be to his detriment, as he starts out with S. Cavalier, and I send in Scrafty. I decide to go for a Dragon Dance right away, as S. Cavalier goes for Swords Dance, which is very unfortunate since I outsped already, and I can just take him out the next turn with a Fire Punch. This is going to do the exact same thing as against Oleana, and trigger my Moxie Boost, and we can just start tearing through Rose's team. And you know, somehow, I managed to trigger more Deja Deja vu from my first sword nuzlocke, but this time it's some good memories of taking down a deranged lunatic. I honestly feel like they could have made Rose a way more difficult boss fight, kind of like Lusamine, but it's easy enough with fighting types. And this means that we only have one more challenger to face, Champion Leon. And Leon can honestly be a pretty difficult opponent, because you can't really set up against his Aegis Slash very easily, and he has some pretty powerful members on his team. Now the very first turn, I decide to go for agility so I can outspeed the next Pokemon as I get hit by a Shadow Ball expecting a Secret Sword so I had the Choppleberry. I can then easily knock out this Aegislash in one hit since its attack stance only has 50 in both defenses. You'll notice I also switched it up to a physical-based Lucario, and as Haxorus comes out, we hit it with an Ice Punch to about over half. We then unfortunately have to say goodbye to Lucario, who's been an invaluable team member this run. I am Iron Man. We then pass the torch on to Steve, who can barely survive an outrage on 18 HP and retaliate with a close combat to take out the Haxorus. This means that we've taken out two of Leon's Pokemon, and he's almost taken out two of ours, so it's a pretty fair trade at this point as he goes into Mr. Rhyme. And Leon evens out the score by going for a Psychic to take out Cap. It ended up being like the old man said, together. I then decide to go into Deadpool, who gets hit by a Teeter Dance, but a Lumberry heals it off, and I can then boost my stats with a Dragon Dance. This, of course, means that I can outspeed the next turn and take out this creepy mime with a crunch. Not exactly an ideal way to get here to sack two of our guys, but at least the score is now in our favor. Dragapult is next, and it doesn't actually have any super effective moves against us, so even though it outspeeds and goes for a dragon breath, we tank it well and take it out with a crunch. This means we're now at plus one speed because of the dragon dance and plus three attack because of the two additional boosts from Moxie, and we can live a snipe shot, taking out Inteleon with a thunder punch. This means we're now at plus four attack and we only have to take on the big bad G-Max Charizard. Now the trouble is that I'm not sure that we can take this thing out with a single Thunder Punch, even at plus four since it has so much health. And if we can't, it's definitely going to get that max airstream off to boost its speed. However, what I didn't anticipate is that Charizard just straight up outspeeds us even with the Dragon Dance. So not only is that bye-bye to our third team member this fight, but we also have to go up against a full health plus speed Charizard. But luckily, I have the Focus Sash on Kamoa so we can live on one HP. And after Charizard gets its speed boost, we can go for a Rock Slide, which does way less than I expected it to. That's quad effective. Come on. This means that Shang-Chi's also going to bite the dust and Leon is quickly evening the odds. But I have a secret weapon, my vibration. Uranium Arm, which means I send in Bucky as Charizard becomes normal size. I then go for a Fake Out, which does about half of the health Charizard has left, so thinking Quick Attack is going to do the job, I go for it, but Charizard manages to fire off a Fire Blast. Luckily for us, though, Charizard has no special attack boost, so we can finish the job with another Quick Attack, which means we did it. We beat a Pokemon Sword Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Fighting Types. And what did I learn this run? Well, Fighting Types are pretty much exactly as busted as you'd expect them to be. And because of that, it made the challenge pretty easy. Even though we had our ups and downs, I think this run was a power trip that I'm happy I got to experience. However, it has me itching for a greater challenge, which is why the next video is probably going to be the hardest challenge so far. So definitely look out for that one. And listen, if you're here at the end of the video and you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? And listen, if you're not subscribed to the other creators featured in this video, I 
I definitely recommend you check out Doc Z, Chaotic Meatball, and Andrew Collette. Their links will be down in the description down below. But guys, until we see each other next time, let me know what challenge you want to see. And until then, have a good one.